Rise Up theme song, take two. Oh. Answering the difficult and critical questions youth may face that relate to Mormon culture and teachings, this is the Rise Up Podcast, produced by Fair Mormon. In this episode of Rise Up, Blake Dalton talks about something that's considered a very fundamental, even primary, air quotes, principle of prayer. But is it that easy? Is it that simple? A few years ago, during the school year of 2012-2013, um, I had a young woman come up to me right after class to ask me a question. She was struggling with some issues at home and some decisions that she was trying to make. And she was really struggling and worrying about um, what she would do and what was right. And she asked me my opinion. And not really knowing how to help her the best, I asked her if she had prayed about it. She said, yeah. And uh, she continued talking. And then as our discussion went on, she stopped me and she said, no, uh, Brother Dalton, you said, did you pray about it? And I said, yeah. And she goes, what do you mean, did you pray about it? And I said, well, uh, what do you think I meant? Um, trying to be a teacher, but trying more to f- understand where she was coming from. She said, well, whenever someone says to me, uh, did you pray about it? I don't exactly know what they mean. She's all, I mentioned it in my prayers. I knelt down. I said my night prayers. And I said, Heavenly Father, help me with this. Or what should I do? She goes, so I mentioned it in my prayers, but what do you mean? What do you mean by pray about it? Is that all I have to do? And to be honest, I wasn't quite sure how to answer her question. I didn't know exactly um, what I meant when I said, did you pray about it? And I think we do that a lot with a lot of uh, responses that we have in the church. Um, We can say things like, I gained a testimony, or I read the Book of Mormon, or I prayed about it. We get caught up with the event or the end result of things that happen rather than the process that is involved in actually getting to that end result. Gaining a testimony doesn't happen just overnight, and then you have it and you never have to work on it again. Something you have to work on and cultivate. Saying prayers is not just kneeling down and praying and then saying, hey, help me with this, get up and then go to bed. Or say it in your morning prayer and you get up and you go to work or go to school. There is more to it than just mentioning it in our prayers. Now, um, Elder Scott in uh, the October 2009 General Conference gave us a little... um, insight into why it's kind of difficult to get inspiration or to get answers to prayers. I'm convinced that there's no simple formula or technique that would immediately allow you to master the ability to be guided by the voice of the Spirit. Our Father expects you to learn how to obtain that divine help by exercising faith in Him and His Holy Son, Jesus Christ. Were you to receive inspired guidance just for the asking, you'd become weak and ever more dependent on them. They know that essential personal growth will come as you struggle to learn how to be led by the Spirit. What may appear initially to be a daunting task will be much easier to manage over time. If you consistently strive to recognize and follow the feelings prompted by the Spirit. So as he explained, we are supposed to struggle a little bit. We're supposed to to nurture this seed of faith to get more out of prayer than just kneeling down and saying it and getting up and going on with our lives. There's more to it than that. And there is no easy way to explain how to do it. An apostle says that. 
So the things that I want to do today in this podcast is I hope I can give you some ideas, some things to look at and to think about so that when you have the opportunity to pray or to think about something or seek inspiration, you have a little better idea of what's involved. Elder Bednar gives us some more information as to why it's a little difficult to gain answers to prayers. This was in the April 2006 General Conference. As we gain experience with the Holy Ghost, we learn that the intensity with which we feel the Spirit's influence is not always the same. Strong, dramatic spiritual impressions do not come to us frequently. Even as we strive to be faithful and obedient, there simply are times when the direction, assurance, and peace of the Spirit are not readily recognizable in our lives. In fact, the Book of Mormon describes faithful Lamanites who were baptized with fire and with the Holy Ghost, and they knew it not. The influence of the Holy Ghost is described in the scriptures as a still, small voice and a voice of perfect mildness. Thus, the Spirit of the Lord usually communicates with us in ways that are quiet, delicate, and subtle. So Elder Bednar gives us some great counsel as to what to look for when we are seeking answers to prayers. Still, small, simple things that come from the Spirit. It does not always come as a grandiose filling. That's sometimes what we're looking for. But we need to get more attuned to the still, small voice those small and simple communications between us and our Father in Heaven, which come through the Holy Ghost. Just like you could not walk into a Spanish class and just instantly know how to speak Spanish. Just like you couldn't walk into a computer coding class and instantly know how to code computer programs. There is subtleties of the Spirit that we need to get more in tune with. Therefore, as two two apostles have told us, it is important to gain insight and experience in understanding the Spirit. And there's no other way to do that but work at it. Now, let me give you one story in the Doctrine and Covenants in section 9. And I think this story is a fantastic story on how to get answers to prayers. But I also think it is one that confuses us as members of the church. This is the story where Oliver Caldry was trying to translate the gold plates with Joseph Smith. And he was striving and he had the desire to translate. And the Lord gave him an opportunity. And it didn't go as good as Oliver had hoped. In fact, it didn't go very well at all. And he went back to the Lord and he said, what happened? Why didn't it work for me? And in section nine, Oliver Cowdery gets an answer from the Lord through Joseph Smith. And in verse seven and eight, there's a few things that I want you to look at. Actually, let's just focus on verse eight. But behold, I say unto you that you must study it out in your mind. Then you must ask me if it be right, and if it is right, I will cause that your bosom shall burn within you. Therefore, you shall feel that it is right. Now, have you heard that before? If you are to get a right answer, you will feel a burning in your bosom. And it goes on in verse 9. But if it not be right, you shall have no such feeling, but you shall have a stupor of thought that shall cause you to forget the thing which is wrong. Therefore, you cannot write that which is sacred, save it be given you from me. Now, this is a fantastic explanation on receiving answers to prayers, but it's a very specific revelation. I want you to remember that this is a revelation to Oliver Cowdery through Joseph Smith on how to translate This is not a specific revelation or rather a general revelation on how to get answers to prayers. It's one way to get an answer to a prayer, not the only way. 
In fact, Elder Oaks said in the Enzyme, March 1997, What does a burning in the bosom mean? Does it need to be a filling of caloric heat, like the burning produced by combustion? If that is the meaning, I have never had a burning in the bosom. Surely the word burning in this scripture signifies a filling of comfort and serenity. This is the witness many receive. That is the way revelation works. Truly, the still small voice is just that, still and small. Close quote. So, Elder Oak says he has never felt a burning in the bosom, meaning some sort of heat in your body. Okay? And so, it's important that we understand that we are listening for a still, small voice, a subtle, still revelation. Now, I'm not saying you can't have the feeling that burning in your bosom that is expressed in the scriptures, but I'm saying don't specifically only look for that or only look for a stupor of thought if it's wrong. Look for how the Spirit is communicating with you because that is what, like Elder Scott and Elder Bednar have taught us, we need to work to see and to learn how it communicates with us. Now, let's go to the book of Ether, chapter, um, I'm going to start in chapter 2. And the book of Ether is a great um, example on how to get um, ideas, how to get answers to prayers. And you know how the story starts. It's a very interesting story. At the Tower of Babel, the languages were confused. And so the brother of Jared and his brother uh, pray and ask for the Lord to not confound their language so that him and his family and their friends can communicate. And ultimately, the Lord leads them away into a promised land um, and gets them ready to cross the ocean to the American continent, the promised land. And um, they go to the Lord, and the Lord tells them how to build boats, these barges. And they're a little different than what they were expecting. And the brother of Jared goes to the Lord because there's three problems that he has with the design of the ship. Now, I want you to think about why the brother of Jared would go with these three problems. They're going to be obvious. But also, how can you liken this to a problem you have? Or maybe your life isn't going the way you were expecting it. And you probably have more problems than just three. But like I said earlier, I want this to just kind of be a general way to look at things and see if it fits into your life. In verse 18, in Ether chapter 2, verse 18, it says, And it came to pass that the brother of Jared cried unto the Lord, saying, O Lord, I have performed the work which thou hast commanded me, and I have made the barges according as thou hast directed me. Now look for the three problems. And behold, O Lord, in them there is no light. Whither shall we steer? And also we shall perish, for in them we cannot breathe. Now, those are three major problems, especially the last one. We can't breathe. That's, you know, you're not going to be able to hold your breath to another continent. So, obviously, the brother of Jared is concerned. Now, I want you to think about these three problems. Air, steering, and light. Okay? Now, the brother of Jared asks, how do I solve these three problems? And the Lord is going to teach us how to get answers to prayers. In verse 20, the Lord answers him. He says, And the Lord said unto the brother of Jared, Behold, thou shalt make a hole in the top and also in the bottom. And when thou shalt suffer for air, thou shalt unstop the hole and receive air. And if it so be that water come in upon thee, behold, ye shall stop the hole that ye may not perish in the flood. Now remember, these boats we're going to go underwater, kind of be like submarines and go below the water and come out of the water. So if they unstopped the hole on the top and water was coming in, hey, you're underwater, plug the hole up. 
right? So that's an obvious statement. So right there, the Lord gives him a straight up answer. How do I get air? And the Lord says, put a hole in the boat. You'll be able to breathe. There might be a problem if you're underwater, but you'll be able to breathe with this hole. So number one, he answered how to get air very specifically, a very specific answer. So the brother of Jared goes and he takes care. He puts the hole in there, comes back to the Lord and he's like, okay, I've done that. I've done what you asked me to do, but there's still a couple other problems. In verse 22, he goes and he says, I've done what you asked me to do. And at the very end of the verse, he says, but uh, behold, O Lord, wilt thou suffer that we shall cross this great water in darkness? You still haven't told us how, you know, there's no light in these boats. What are we going to do? And the Lord says to him in verse 23, what will ye that I should do that ye may have light in your vessels? For behold, ye cannot have windows for they will be dashed in pieces. Neither shall you take fire with you for ye shall not go by the light of fire. Now that's a great statement because you wouldn't want to light a fire in a wooden boat, right? So he says, what do you want me to do? But in verse 24, he answers the brother of Jared how the steering problem is going to get taken care of. He says, For behold, ye shall be as a whale in the midst of the sea, for the mountain waves shall dash upon you. Nevertheless, look here, I will bring you up again out of the depths of the sea, for the winds have gone forth out of my mouth, and also the rains and the floods have I sent forth. So how are they going to steer? The Lord is going to steer them. The Lord is going to move them. The winds are going out of his mouth and the floods he has sent forth. So in order to get air, he got a specific answer. How do we steer? He said, don't worry about it. I will take care of it. You will be in my hands. So verse 25, he's still wondering about light. And behold, I prepare you against these things, for ye cannot cross this great deep, save I prepare you against the waves of the sea, and the winds which have gone forth, and the floods which shall come. Therefore, what will ye that I should prepare for you, that ye may have light when ye are swallowed up in the depths of the sea? What are you going to prepare so that you can have light? Now, brothers and sisters, I believe that each of us are in the same situation at some point as the brother of Jared. When we pray, we may be asking for inspiration on how to get air, whatever air is, because we want a specific answer from the Lord. We want him to say, you want to know what college to go to? You want to know if you should take this job? Yes, take that one. Take the one on the right but it doesn't work that way. Sometimes we're praying and we're saying, Heavenly Father, please take care of everything for me. Like steering. But often the Lord is saying, I want you to figure something out, bring it to me and let's work on it together. That doesn't mean I want you to answer your own prayers and stop bothering me. It means as Elder Scott and Elder Bednar explained, we need to work a little bit more. Now, I have always wondered why in the world the brother of Jared did what he did next. When you think about it, and you guys know the story, how does he decide to get light? Well, he goes and he, he gets six stones and shines them up and works on them and then brings them to the Lord. And in fact, in uh, chapter 3 of the book of Ether, verse 3 I'm going to start midway through verse three, where it says, O Lord, look upon me in pity and turn away thine anger from this thy people and suffer not that they shall go forth across this raging deep in darkness. But behold these things which I have molten out of rock. Now let's see if this rings any bells. And I know, O Lord, that thou hast all power and can do whatsoever thou wilt for the benefit of man 
Therefore, touch these stones, O Lord, with thy finger and prepare them that they may shine forth in darkness. And they shall shine forth unto us in the vessel which we have prepared, that we may have light while we shall cross the sea. Now, the Lord asked him to prepare something. And he came back and he said, this is what I've prepared. Please have mercy on me because I'm not sure I'm doing it right. What do you think? Can you help me? I need help. And the Lord answers him and you know how he answers him. But I want to go back to why he chose these stones. And I don't know the specific answer, but I'm going to give you some interesting information. If you look on your seminary uh, Old Testament scripture mastery card, or if you have an institute manual of the Old Testament and it gives the timeline of the Old Testament, you'll notice that Noah is alive several hundred years after the Tower of Babel. And so I would think that Noah is a pretty prominent figure in the lives of all the people who are working on the Tower of Babel, including the brother of Jared. Now, we know through um, the rest of the book of Ether that the brother of Jared had records, had um, a record of his people, and he knew the story of, you know, his ancestors. So, if you go, and this might be a good cross-reference, for um, the book of Ether to go and look at the f- first or the other time that we know of somebody building a boat. The book of Ether is the first time somebody builds a boat to travel across the great deep in the book of Mormon. But the book of Genesis chapter 6 has information on Noah building the ark. And in one of the verses, verse 16, as, he's tell- as Noah is learning how many rooms to make and what kind of wood to make it out of and how many cubits and, and what type of um, ship this is going to be, in verse 16, the Lord says, A window shalt thou make to the ark, and in a cubit shalt thou finish it above, and the door of the ark shalt thou set in the side thereof with lower, second, and third stories shalt thou make it. Now, that's kind of a random verse, but the footnotes is what I want you to look at. In verse 16, the footnote for window is a Hebrew word called sohar. If you use your footnote A, it says there that some rabbis believe it was a precious stone that shone in the ark. They didn't put a window, but they put a precious stone So, I don't think it's hard to believe that the brother of Jared, in trying to figure out how to get an answer, how to prepare something for the Lord to help him accomplish this really confusing problem, the brother of Jared not only prayed, but he went to the scriptures and he went to the things that the Lord had already taught the people. He went and studied about his ancestors, about the people who came before, and he knew that Noah had built a ship. How did Noah get light in the ship? Well, according to Jewish tradition, some rabbis believe Noah didn't have windows in the ark, but that he had stones in there that shone. Perhaps the brother of Jared read those verses of scripture and said, I'm going to try that. And I'm going to take that to the Lord. We know what happened afterwards. We know that the Savior touched those stones and brought light forth. But brothers and sisters, that light begins with knowledge and begins with the scriptures. The scriptures are the vocabulary of God. And if we want to know how he answers prayers to his children... We can read those words and see how they received answers and try to use similar ideas. Now, I'm not saying all of us are going to build a boat and that that understanding how you build an ark is is a relevant um, revelation here in our day and age because it's not. But the great thing about the scriptures is we can liken them to our lives. 
when we're praying, are we hoping to get answers on how to get air, very specific? But the Lord is saying, I'd like you to prepare something and come to me. Let's work on it together. And maybe we don't get an answer at all because the Lord is saying, let me steer the boat. But the bottom line is what's in verse 25 of chapter 2, the word prepare. He is preparing us against tough times. And behold, in chapter 2, verse 25, and behold, I prepare you against these things, whatever you're going through. For ye cannot cross this great deep, save I prepare you against the waves of the sea. And the winds have gone forth, and the floods which shall come. Therefore, what will ye that I should prepare for you that ye may have light? What are you going to do that you need light? And how are you going to prepare for that? There is all sorts of ways. Praying and studying your scriptures are the two most basic ways. Elder Holland said in a BYU fireside in 2004, God expects you to have enough faith and determination, enough trust in him to keep moving, keep living, keep rejoicing. In fact, he expects you not simply to face the future. That sounds pretty grim and stoic. He expects you to embrace it and shape it, to love it and rejoice in it and delight in your opportunities. God is anxiously waiting for the chance to answer your prayers and fulfill your dreams, just as he always has. But he can't if you don't pray, and he can't if you don't dream. In short, he can't if you don't believe. I love how he puts that, and I love how every one of these apostles who we've heard from today have given us hope. We are not alone. We just need to get better at understanding and perhaps work a little harder at it. Now, if you'd like some more information on this that you could read, um, I found a fantastic article in the end, or actually in the New Era in June 2014's edition of the New Era. And it's an article written by Rachel Nielsen. And it's called, What if I don't feel a burning in the bosom? I hope that some of the stuff we've talked about is helpful. I hope that you're able to maybe get some ideas and a little more inspiration about how to go to Heavenly Father and seek answers. And as Elder Holland said, we can get answers because Heavenly Father wants us to get answers. We just need to put forth the effort. So let's do that. Let's work a little bit harder at our prayers and at our scripture study because that helps us get answers as well. Thank you for listening to this episode of Rise Up. This has been a production of Fair Mormon. This and other podcasts are available at fairmormon.org. The opinions expressed in this podcast are not necessarily the views of Fair Mormon or the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. Please subscribe to our show in iTunes under the name Mormon Faircast. Questions or comments can be posted at blog.fairmormon.org in conjunction with this episode. Tune in each week for another episode of Rise Up. Thank you for listening.